Hello and welcome to The Crime Reel. For this week's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the mysterious disappearance of Judy Smith, a 50-year-old nurse from Massachusetts who went missing in 1997. Judy was born on the 15th of December 1946 and spent her whole life living in Massachusetts. Just after she graduated from high school, she married for the first time. However, the marriage was short-lived after her husband fled to Sweden to avoid being drafted to the Vietnam War. She tracked him down but returned alone, the marriage over. Sometime later, Judy married for a second time to a man by the name of Charles Bradford. The couple worked together exercising horses at thoroughbred tracks and then went on to have two children, Amy and Craig. This marriage also ended in divorce and Judy was left to raise their two children alone. Judy met her third husband, Jeffrey Smith, whilst working as a home nurse caring for Jeffrey's elderly father. They dated for many years until they tied the knot in 1996. Jeffrey was a specialist in healthcare law and eight months after the wedding, the couple planned a trip together. First, they would travel to Philadelphia where Jeffrey was due to moderate a panel discussion at a convention after which they were due to visit friends in New Jersey. On April 9, 1997, the couple travelled together to Logan International Airport, Boston. Upon arrival at the airport, Judy discovered that she had left her driver's licence at home. Without identification, she was unable to board the flight so it was decided that Jeffrey would catch the original flight whilst Judy would catch a later one. They agreed to meet at their hotel in Philadelphia later that evening. The following morning Jeffrey woke first and went downstairs to get breakfast. When he returned to the room Judy was awake and in the shower. The couple both got dressed ready for their respective days. Jeffrey was staying at the hotel to attend the conference, whilst Judy, on her first visit to Philadelphia, planned to spend the day visiting the city's many tourist attractions. They agreed to meet back at their hotel room at the end of the day to get ready to attend the conference's cocktail party together at 6pm that evening. Once Jeffrey had finished moderating the final session of the day, he returned to the hotel room only to find it empty. Judy was not there. He thought that maybe she had returned, changed and gone down to the party ahead of him. However, when he went downstairs to check on this, Judy was not at the party either. After going back and forth between the party and the room, he started to get increasingly concerned. While Jeffrey knew that there could be a number of reasons why Judy might have been delayed, he found it out of character that she hadn't made contact with him. Jeffrey called home and spoke to Judy's son, asking him to check the answer phone for any messages. This drew a blank. He began calling the hospitals in the area to see if Judy had been admitted, but there was no record of her. Growing ever more concerned for his wife's safety, Jeffrey left the hotel and flagged down a taxi. He paid the taxi driver to slowly follow the route of the tourist bus that he believed Judy would have caught to see if there was any sign of her. Despite his efforts, he was still not able to locate his wife. Finally, at around midnight, Jeffrey went to the Philadelphia police station to report his wife missing. Jeffrey found the police to be dismissive of his concerns, stating that he was unable to file a missing person report as Judy had not been missing for 24 hours. After spending the remainder of the night sleepless in the hotel room, the next morning Jeffrey spoke with the mayor of Philadelphia, Ed Rendell, and John Purzel, a member of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, who were both in attendance at the conference. Jeffrey told them that he felt that he had been poorly treated by the police the previous evening. It seems these conversations may have made a difference, as when Jeffrey returned to the police station to file his report, two detectives were waiting to take it and he was treated with courtesy and respect. 
A preliminary search of the area failed to turn up any clues. Judy had simply disappeared. Flyers were posted around the city in an attempt to locate her, and whilst there were several possible sightings of Judy reported in the Philadelphia area, many of which detailed a woman who was disoriented, confused, and behaving erratically. Many of these were ultimately ruled out, as it was confirmed that they were actually a homeless woman who had a strong resemblance to Judy. Days into the investigation, the police raised doubts about where Judy was when she disappeared, and if she had ever even been in Philadelphia. This line of thought created a rift between the police and Jeffrey. Police Captain John McGuinness explained that when you look at the statistics, 85-90% to 90 of female homicides are killed by someone very close to them. A family member, spouse, boyfriend. Statistically, we have to look at Jeffrey Smith as a suspect until it's proven that he is not a suspect. The police expressed doubt that Judy had ever been in Philadelphia. Since Judy was an experienced traveller, why had she forgotten her driver's licence? A female detective who searched the hotel room said that she found it strange that the clothes Judy left behind did not appear to have been worn, suggesting that Judy had worn the same clothes both on her flight from Boston and also the day of her disappearance. She also noted that Judy had not brought any cosmetics with her on the trip, a fact that the police felt was unusual. According to the police, only one other person, a desk clerk, saw Judy at the hotel and they questioned how accurate this recollection was. The police also claimed that Jeffrey refused to take a lie detector test. However, Jeffrey claims he never refused. He only insisted that any such test should be administered by the FBI and that if he passed, the police formally request that the Bureau assist with its investigation. According to the police captain, at the time Jeffrey made this demand, Jeffrey was already aware that the FBI would not do this. Again, Jeffrey refused to take the test even when the Philadelphia police arranged for it to be administered by the Massachusetts State Police. Deputy Commissioner Richard Zappile stated certain conditions were met, but as far as I'm concerned, he refused. This then led to even more suspicion falling upon Jeffrey's shoulders. As time went on, Jeffrey hired two private investigators to look for his wife. He also mailed copies of his wife's missing person flyer to hospitals all over the country, asking them to keep an eye out for her. It was then, some five months after Judy's disappearance, a body was discovered. On September 7th, 1997, a father and son who were on a hunting trip together in Asheville, North Carolina, found human bones scattered in the forest. In the centre of the scattered bones was a shallow grave that appeared to have been uncovered by wild animals. The state medical examiner determined that the bones of the then unidentified person were those of a white woman between the ages of 40 and 55. She had had extensive dental work and suffered from severe arthritis in her left knee. There were also cutting marks on her ribs and clothing, from which it was concluded that she had been fatally stabbed. An emergency room doctor in North Carolina saw an article about the discovery in the newspaper and connected it to one of the flyers that Jeffrey had sent out. After that, the North Carolina police obtained Judy's dental records and discovered that they were a match. Judy had been found 600 miles from where she had last been seen but how did she get there? Why was she there and who killed her? The evidence found surrounded the grave suggested that Judy had been with someone else, possibly whoever killed her, and that she had been alive when she arrived in North Carolina. She had been wearing jeans and hiking boots, appropriate to the area where she was found. They were not the clothes that she had been wearing when she left the hotel in Philadelphia. The investigators found $167 and Judy's wedding ring on her body. From this they concluded that robbery was not the motive for Judy's killing. Her red backpack was never found, nor any of the clothes that she had been wearing when she was last seen. Judy's family believed that the expensive pair of sunglasses found near her body did not belong to her.
but it was never established who they actually belonged to. Judy's family could not imagine any reason why she would have travelled to North Carolina. According to them, she never expressed any desire to go there and did not have any known acquaintances in the area. Several people in Asheville recalled having seen Judy or a woman matching her description back in April 1997. A clerk at a local retailer said, She seemed very alert to me. She was very pleasant. I didn't see anything about her that would indicate that she wasn't right in any way. The woman she talked to said her husband was a lawyer from Boston, attending a conference in Philadelphia, and during that time she had just decided to go to the Asheville area. At a campground near where her body was found, the owner recalled that a woman matching Judy's description drove up in a grey sedan filled with boxes and asked if she could spend a night there in her car. She drove away when she was told that this was not possible. A third sighting was by a delicatessen owner in the same area. She said that Judy approached her store driving a grey sedan and bought $30 worth of sandwiches and a toy truck. Local investigators consider these three sightings to be credible and yet it is still not known why she was in the area and who, if anyone, she was with. Investigators at the Buncombe County Sheriff's Office in North Carolina eventually ruled out Jeffrey Smith as a suspect in Judy's death. His presence at the conference on the day that Judy disappeared could be verified and they believe that Jeffrey, who had various health conditions, would not have been physically able to complete the murder. However, the Philadelphia police never completely eliminated him as a suspect. It is possible that Judy planned her disappearance and then met with foul play in two unrelated incidents. While Jeffrey and her children did not say there had been any problems in the marriage, one of Judy's friends said otherwise. Carolyn Dickey, in a documentary interview, said, At the time this happened, Jeff and Judy's marriage was very tenuous. I believe that something did happen that triggered her to want to have some time away from Jeff. Did Judy want to escape her life? Was she having a midlife crisis? Or maybe she had run off to meet someone before meeting her untimely end? It has also been suggested that Judy might have fallen victim to a local serial killer who less than a year earlier had left the body of one of his victims tied to a tree not too far away from where Judy's body was discovered. However, Gary Michael Hilton, who was later convicted of that crime as well as several other killings, has never been linked to Judy's death. The state of North Carolina and Jeffrey combined to offer $17,000 in reward money for any information leading to the resolution of the case, but the reward was never claimed. To this day, Judy's disappearance and murder remains a mystery. Jeffrey Smith passed away in 2005, obviously never knowing who murdered his wife. That concludes today's story. There won't be a post this week. I'm just going to pause them for a little while to see if YouTube might consider helping me again with views. Please subscribe if you're new to the channel as well. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye.